Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman and today I'm going to start a 24, 25 videos series on ECG. Now, as you can see, my emphasis would be on interpretation of ECG, not just recognizing certain patterns, but you need to understand why these changes happen and and then you can kind of think apply them better. Now, it, it has got a full curriculum. I will cover the entire ECG one by one. And today we are going to start with the first one, introduction. Uh, this is the whole contents and you can see, I'm sure once it is completely populated, you can go to any video directly. But of course, uh, I suggest that you should proceed as listed here to have a better uh, understanding because of course I will not be able to discuss everything in every video so some basic things would be discussed in the basic videos and then later on we will focus on that particular topic now for example uh, if there is a right bundle branch block and that would be followed by left bundle branch block some of the details will be discussed in the first video and skip in the second so it would be best if you proceed accordingly of course you could also go to any video directly so let's take introduction today now what is an ecg ecg is uh, you know our heart is excitable tissue uh, it consists of muscle mass which contracts in response to the current it receives from the SA node through our conduction system. The SA node has got the unique ability to produce current and then conduction system it spreads to the entire ventricle so that the ventricle and of course first atria and then ventricles and that uh, gets depolarized and then repolarized and that results into contraction. And then the cycle repeats again and again. So I will be uh, discussing just the ECG part. Of course, the rest of cardiology I have covered elsewhere. So we will be focusing on ECG in these videos. So today is the introduction. Just the basic concepts of ECG, its usefulness in medicine, and what is uh, the basic complex of ECG and the heart rate calculation. And we also need to learn, uh, we need to understand the ECG paper and also the ECG machine. So I'll spend some time there also. So this is our heart. Now, heart is a very complex structure, but I will be focusing only on what is relevant to ECG. The current is produced by a specialized tissue called SA node. It is present in the right atrium higher up. And then the current which is produced spreads into the atria, resulting in atrial depolarization. That is immediately followed by atrial depolarization. And current then passes through AV node. And current is actually held in AV node for some time. And this is to make sure that atrial depolarization always precedes ventricular depolarization. Once current passes uh, through the AV node, it spreads very fast very very fast almost electrifying speed this is because nature wants the whole ventricular mass to get depolarized almost instantaneously so that it results into a an effective and synchronous contraction now imagine a current pa passing slowly this way and that followed by a contractile wave so that would not produce an effective stroke volume and many things can happen to this normal function. There could be problem in SA node, problem in the AV node, problem in any of the conduction system. There could be an ectopic focus producing current in the atria or ventricles or heart rate may con contract very, very fast or in an irregular fashion or it may stop contracting or there may be various types of blocks. So all these things and uh, ischemia could result in some changes in ECG. All these would be covered in these videos. Now, what is the diagnostic value of ECG? As I said in the beginning, 
uh, every diagnostic tool has got a plus side and the negative side. Plus side means strong points. Now, ECG has got extremely important role in the diagnosis of ischemic heart disease and cardiac arrhythmias and blocks. In ischemic heart disease, particularly when it comes to the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, and you all know in acute coronary syndrome, we have to make medical decisions very, very promptly. And ECG is usually the first test we perform. And in many cases, ECG can tell us what type of acute coronary syndrome this patient might have or if this patient has normal ECG. And then patient follows the particular trajectory. Cardiac arrhythmias and blocks can be diagnosed on ECG. And in fact, some of the arrhythmias, some of the blocks, they actually cannot be diagnosed without ECG at all. So the very definition of these arrhythmias and blocks is based on ECG. So I would say that ECG is indispensable in the diagnosis of certain types of ischemic heart disease and arrhythmias. But it has some useful role in all these conditions related to heart. For example, chamber enlargement. Now imagine you have somebody with a systolic ejection murmur on the base of heart. It could be from aortic stenosis or uh, pulmonary stenosis. Now, if you are unable to differentiate, now if you see the ECG in this patient, in case there is clear-cut right ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG, that would favor the diagnosis of pulmonary stenosis because pulmonary stenosis would cause right ventricular hypertrophy. And if it is left ventricular hypertrophy pattern, it would favor left ventricular outflow obstruction, maybe aortic valve stenosis. So this is how ECG helps. Similarly, in some electrolyte abnormalities, the standard for electrolyte abnormality is still blood test. But ECG can give you very, very prompt diagnosis. Blood test would take at least one or two hours, uh, maybe faster, but uh, ECG is like in minutes. So ECG would give you some clue to the diagnosis of hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, and some other electrolyte abnormalities. Congenital heart disease, just like uh, in rheumatic heart disease, we could have some indirect information favoring a particular disease. Rheumatic heart disease, same concept. So in these conditions, ECG would have some useful role, but as I said earlier, in these two conditions, it is actually indispensable. So this is your ECG machine. We have various types of machine, the traditional single channel and the most modern 12 channel. And this one is triple channel uh, ECG machine and paper comes from here. And this is the LCD and these are the controls. And some of these things, this is uh, the power cable. This one is power cable and this is the earthing cable. And these are the chest electrodes. You can see at these there are six of them. And these are chest electrode suction cups. And this is for the recording on the USB. And these are the clamps which we apply on the limbs. This has got color codings. And the, right, the red one goes to the right arm. Uh, this should be yellow actually. I think different countries follow different color codes. In, in Pakistan, we have yellow which is for the left arm. Green is for the left leg. And the black is for the right leg. So this is actually uh, the machine. And triple channel ECG machines, they would show uh, the tracings here and the paper will come out from here. And this is actually a paper which is thermosensitive. So if you do not keep it well, then it might lose its, uh, it might fade out with time, especially if it is exposed to sun. Uh, the most modern machines, they, they print on simple A4 color through computer. So that is permanent record. So these are the, some of the things I would like to explain. Filter, there is something on this machine. There's a button which is called filter. If you press that button, you will get a neater ECG tracings. Earth, like any sensitive equipment should have earth. ECG is very, very sensitive equipment, so it should be properly earth. Electrodes, I have already explained. These are precordial chest electrodes, and these are the limb electrodes. Gel is actually electrolyte rich gel is a, is a substance which is applied to the skin because our skin has a dead superficial uh, layer and that may not allow conduction of uh, 
very very low quantity of the current so if gel is applied that would improve conduction if professional quality gel is not available this household soap works pretty as well as the gel then recording speed ecg can be recorded at at, at whatever speed the, the three speeds which are usually possible 12 25 uh, and and uh, 50 i think it's 12.5 uh, 20, uh, 25 and 50 standard recording speed is 25 so unless it is specified and it would be printed on the ec paper unless specified you should assume it is recorded at 25 seconds per uh, 25 uh, mm per second now why it is important because the intervals and the width of various waves would assume that ecg is recorded at standard speed if ecg is recorded at double the standard speed then all those durations and width will also be double then there is a something called sensitivity now all ecg machines they have a button which can once you press it will make a box showing the sensitivity the standard sensitivity is 1 mm ecg uh, electrode would record 10 small square deflection i'll show you in subsequent slide so these things you need to know i think maybe your nurse or your technician is doing ecg but in some emergency case you might have to do it yourself so i believe you need to understand ecg machine well now this is the ecg paper this is not the actual paper i have actually drawn this paper to make things more clear now horizontally this paper these lines indicate time this is the smallest square the smallest uh, the closest to line is 0.04 seconds and this is called small square and then there's a large square that would reflect 0.2 seconds then five large squares or 25 small square would indicate 1 second provided ecg is recorded at 25 mm per second and this box would appear in other slides also in this dimension it reflects time five small squares equivalent to 0.2 seconds and this is vertically vertical would reflect millivolt 10 would represent 1 millivolt i'll just show you so this one is 0.04 this one is 0.2 and this one is 1 second this is the ecg paper showing deflection this is the standard deflection if you if you press the button labeled as sensitivity it would make this box and if you count this deflection consists of 10 small squares or two large squares so this is equivalent to 1 millivolt when we talk about hypertrophy of ventricles or atria we talk about the amplitude and it would depend on the sensitivity for example if you make it half standard deflection the same electrical activity would be recorded as half the amplitude which is just five small square now if you record ecg at double the standard deflection it would make 20 small square now why would you do that this is the standard deflection why do we want to record at a half deflection or the double deflection sometimes complexes may be too big they may not fit on the paper so you would like to reduce them to half but then you have to make this appropriate adjustment when you make a judgment on a hypertrophy and when complexes are too small and then you might want to make them bigger they look bigger and then please note down then you should apply the criteria of amplitude considering the fact that it is recorded at double standard deflection this 10 small square representing 1 millivolt is based on the fact that this is standard deflection now before you comment on a particular ecg i suggest that you should look at the quality of ecg any test need to be of good quality i think gross abnormalities you could still make if ecg is not of great quality but something like uh, small uh, fine diagnosis like atrial fibrillation 
or some kind of blocks, I think you need to have a good quality ECG. It should bear a label indicating which person this ECG belonged and at what time this ECG was recorded. This may be important when you are following certain things uh, over time, like somebody having acute coronary syndrome, you may be repeating ECG, or you are treating with somebody with some hyperkalemia, you are repeating ECG and seeing what is the progress. That means it must bear the time and the date. Then speed with what it is recorded, it is normally printed on the paper. By default, it would be 25 millimeter per second. Deflection, again, a box will appear at least once before the ECG. In many cases, it would appear before every new set of ECG, uh, before new set of three uh, tracings. Artifacts. Sometimes artifacts may mislead you. Uh, something could be artifact, but it might give you a wrong uh, diagnosis, so you be aware and you need to be familiar with those artifacts and be able to recognize them. <laughs> These are some of the common artifacts. Of course, there could be others. For example, this is the normal ECG, but this is what is called motion artifact. Very high frequency waves, very, very fast rate, and this is, of course, not tachycardia because ECG before and after that is perfect and this is just a motion artifact. This is a thing, poor earthing, the poor contact. This is again patient may be breathing and the baseline is uh, going up and down and this could uh, give you the wrong impression about ST depression and ST elevation. These are some of the examples. Uh, this might give you the impression that this is flutter but this is actually what is called pseudo flutter. Somebody had tremor of the hands and this is recorded because it, it did not appear on the precordial, it only appeared on the, on the arms. So uh, if, it, if it was flutter, it would appear on the precordial leaves also. These are some of the examples of uh, some artifacts. There are actually other also. One of the common errors, common mistakes is called this reversal of uh, leads. Now, although ECG electrodes are color coded, but since it is recorded by humans and humans are prone to make mistakes, sometimes lead one electrode may be reversed. The one on the right arm should may go to the left and vice versa. So, uh, the, the deflection, ECG deflection would just appear opposite. Now, if you see this ECG, it might suggest dextrocardia. This is limb lead one. But if you correct the abdominality, it will be normalized. Like this one, the actual ECG, upright, upright P wave, QRS compressed. This was just because the uh, leads were uh, reversed. There are several uh, such examples, but lead one is the commonest one, which is reverse. We call it technical dextrocardia. It gives you the impression of the dextrocardia, but actually it is just a technical error. This is another example of technical dextrocardia. Let me give you some more detail here. From this ECG, you might think that this is right axis deviation, uh, one of the possibilities uh, dextrocardia. Uh, but if you see the other leads, namely 2, 3, 2 and 3 upright and uh, you probably already know, and if you do not know, I'll explain to you later, but in a lead 1, 2, and 3, all the complexes should be upright. So you expect QRS complex here upright, but it, in this case, it is uh, downward. This might suggest dextrocardia, but if you examine precordial leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, they are pretty normal. So that means it is not actual dextrocardia, it is just the reversal of leads. Okay, let's go to the next one now. Now, this is the routine ECG interpretation. If when you are, when you see an ECG, you have to see all these six or seven things. First of all, you have to make sure that ECG bears the level and it is good quality. Then you study the rate, the rhythm, the waveform, mean QRS axis, ST segment, QR inter QT interval, and other things. And you have to examine all of them one by one. And you might think that this is going to be a long process. No, once you know your stuff, 
in my opinion, most ECGs, they need one minute or less to make a final diagnosis. There may be some which may need little more time and there are some ECG abnormalities which you might never know uh, what exactly is the problem, but most routine ECGs, diagnosis is possible in one minute. All these things can be uh, commented upon in just one minute or maybe less. This is the actual potential and this is only to complete the module. This is the electrical activity occurring in the SA node. This is called spontaneous diastolic depolarization. SA node has this inherent ability to build up current and at a certain point, which is called threshold point, it just fires and that results into impulse formation. Now these are various phases. This is the impulse formation. And these are various phases, phase 1, 2, phase 3 and phase 4. And this then would repeat. At what rate? That would depend on the level of sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. If the sympathetic is predominant, then heart rate will be faster and this will be faster also. It will be coming more frequently. And if the parasympathetic activity is dominant, when there is bradycardia, then it would be getting uh, this will be rather flattened and hard, it will be slow. Now, this is I'm going to show you uh, the basic mechanism of uh, depolarization and repolarization. I'm going to uh, play some animation. I hope you understand it and I hope you like it. This is SA node and this is beating itself with an inherent rate. Of course, control with sympathetic, parasympathetic system, but it has got a certain inherent rate, which is in normal person about 70. Now, this would not produce any ECG change at all because it is not depolarizing or repolarizing. But once this current goes out, it would first depolarize atria and then ventricle. Now, let's watch the uh, animation and see how this depolarization, repolarization results into this ECG waveform. So this is depolarization, repolarization, and then ventricle depolarization, repolarization. Okay. So atrial depolarization, repolarization made this part. This part was depolarization. This was the repolarization, and ventricular depolarization was the QRS complex, and ventricular repolarization is the rest of the complex like. ST and T wave and in some cases U wave. Now I'm going to play it twice again so that you understand this better. Did you notice that the ventricular depolarization and repolarization occurs after a delay? Why delay? Because current is held in a V node. Now let's watch it once again and then we proceed. All right. So this is the normal uh, mechanism. Current is produced in SA node. It goes into the atria. First, of course, right atrium and immediately left atrium followed by atrial depolarization. During that time, current is held in AV node. Once released into the ventricle, first ventricular depolarization, then repolarization. Okay. So this is what we get. This is the ECG. Now this, suppose the process starts here. The first wave we see is P wave. P wave is atrial depolarization. And I'll show you some more detail. This is PR interval. This is QRS complex. And this is ST uh, segment. And this is T wave. And this is U wave as labeled. We also have mentioned their intervals. But I'm going to show you in some other slides. I think you can just register this overall pattern. This is one cardiac cycle and this would re keep repeating uh, throughout our life. 
Now these are the same waves but I have drawn manually to make things better. This is the QLS complex and first we will talk about the P wave. Okay. Now all the recordings, all the intervals, all the amplitudes assume that this ACG is recorded at the standard speed of 25 millimeter per second and standard deflection of 10 small squares per millivolt. So this one, the shaded part is P wave. Okay, P wave. This part is P wave. It reflects by atrial depolarization and its duration is less than 0.12 seconds which is equivalent to three small squares, three small squares, one, two whole squares and then half on each side. So three small squares and the amplitude of any P wave should not be more than 0.2 millivolt. That is two small square. It represents bi atrial depolarization. This is PR interval. The PR interval represents bi atrial depolarization and repolarization because it includes P waves. So it is depolarization as well as repolarization plus AV nodal delay. The, it also includes the duration for which current is held in the AV node. So this would be very relevant when we talk about various types of hard blocks. AV nodal delay is maximum PR interval is 0.2 seconds, which is equivalent to five small squares. Now, please note down PR interval starts from the P wave, the start of the P wave, it, including P wave, and it ends where QRS complex starts. This little downward deflection is Q wave, and that would not be included. PR interval. Now this is QRS complex. It consists of three waves. The first downward deflection is Q wave. This is normal physiological Q wave. Then we have big R wave and then we have S wave. What is the definition of Q wave? It is the first downward deflection that is called Q wave. If there is no first downward deflection, then the first point of QRS complex is called Q. And the R wave is the first upward deflection following a Q wave. And the S wave is first downward deflection following an R wave. There could be an additional R wave, we call it R prime, that we see in bundle branch blocks that we will discuss when we, we take up that module. So what is QRS complex? It is biventricular depolarization. And duration should be less than 0.1 second, which is equivalent to 2.5 small squares. You can confirm here one, two and a half, two and a half. The whole QRS complex should be less than 2.5 small squares. If it is broader than that, broader than that, it would reflect either a bundle branch block or in some cases ventricular rhythm or some other problems. We will discuss when we take up those conditions. So the morphologies are different types depending upon which lead you are talking about. Usually upright in all three limb leads except AVR. Uh, uh, three limb leads mean lead one, two, three. But in other leads in AVR it is usually downward. R wave grows and S wave shrinks as we move from V1 to V6. I'll show you in normal ECG at the end of this module and we will appreciate this point, how these QRS complex complexes, they vary in different uh, uh, leads. So when we talk about a QRS complex, we will be concerned about its breadth mentioned here, its amplitude, how high, tall, I haven't given criteria here because it varies, which, uh, it varies uh, from lead to lead. And also various morphological abnormalities. Now we again will discuss in subsequent lectures. This is the ST segment. We do not worry too much about its uh, duration, but uh, most important thing about ST segment is the fact if it is isoelectric or not. So isoelectric means that ST segment should have be, should be at the same level as PR interval or even more importantly T P 
interval. The interval between T wave and the P wave of the next QRS complex. It should be at the same level. Now let's see what is the case here. Now if you draw a line, you can see this line falls just below the PR interval, the ST segment and TP interval. That means in this case, ST segment is isoelectric. If it is above this, if this part is above this line, we call it ST segment elevation. That is very significant in ischemic heart disease, in pericarditis and many other conditions. And when this ST segment is significantly below the line, then we call it ST depression and that is again significant in many conditions, most importantly ischemia, but in many other conditions we will dis discuss later. So ventricular uh, repolarization and it should be isoelectric. The last thing is actually QT interval. This is entire ventricular electrical activity, both depolarization and repolarization, but only ventricular. So it would include Q wave, R wave, S wave, S segment, T wave. And it starts the start of the Q wave ends with the end of T wave. And normally its duration, if the heart rate is stable at about 60 to 100 within the normal physical, physiological range, the QT interval should be 0.4 seconds or 16 uh, small square. Uh, but this is dependent on heart rate. You all know whenever we uh, run, the heart rate also increases and that usually affects this phase of ECG, not the rest of the that. So we need to correct this QT interval for heart rate. There are conditions called QT syndrome, prolonged QT syndrome or short QT syndrome and that concept will be applicable only if you have corrected QT uh, interval for the rate. Now there is a formula here. QTC, this is corrected QT, is equal to QT, which we see here, divided by under square of RR. RR means the distance between two adjacent R waves. So this is how we calculate the corrected QT. Long and short QT syndromes are relevant here. Now, so what is the normal ECG? when everything on ECG is normal. It has got a normal rate. Normal rate is between 60 to 100. Of course, there could be a person who may be absolutely healthy. Heart rate at that given time may be less than 60 or more than 100. But mostly resting ECG would have heart rate within 60 to 100. So it should have a normal rate. It should have sinus rhythm. That means on ECG you can tell that rhythm arose from SA node and then the normal pattern of depolarization was followed. And it has got normal axis. You might not understand all this at this stage, but later on you will definitely uh, start understanding all those once we go through this, these videos. Normal axis, uh, of course, any of these abnormalities does not make the patient is seriously sick, nor the normal ECG rules out a potentially a serious heart disease. But when it comes to ECG, you have to make sure all these things are normal. Then we scan PQRST morphology. We start from P wave and then PR interval, then QRS and then ST segment, then T wave. And then we examine all these in all cardiac cycles and we make sure that everything is okay. So if all that is normal. Now I'm going to describe how to calculate heart rate. This, this is the formula. We divide 1500 with the number of small squares between two adjacent RR. Now, would you wonder where this figure of 1500 uh, comes from? Now, this is the concept. We have seen that if ECG is recorded at 25 millimeter per second, so 25, and since we want to know the heart rate per minute, so 25 into 60 is 1500. So this is the 1500 and this is the number of small square between 2 RR. Now if heart rate is between 1600, that is normal, and below 60 would be called bradycardia, and above 100 is called tachycardia. 
Now let's do some exercise. This is an ECG and most of the ECGs are shown in this style. Lead 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. These are actually uh, uh, not continuous recording. Here there is a change of lead and here again there is a change of lead. You can see this, but this one is continuous. Whenever you want to calculate heart rate or you want to comment on rhythm, you must see this continuous ECG. In this case, the strip is V1. All right. Uh, so let's calculate the heart rate. You can, you have to count. First, you make sure that rhythm is stable. There is, it is stable. And then you have to identify two adjacent R waves and count the number of small square between two R's. Now, for example, if I allow this one, this is R wave, this is S wave. You could actually do it from any prominent part. You could use this R wave or you could use this S wave, whatever. So in this case, the number of small square between two R wave is 34. So I have calculated the heart rate and it is given here. Let's take another example. Now this of course anybody who knows this stuff and everybody would from the first look would show that it is sticky card. Yeah, but we need to examine it in some more detail. And let's see and number of R R number of so, small square between two adjacent R waves and I have Enlarge this and let's see. Now, this is the between these two R waves, we have eight small squares. Now, if we know the formula 1500 divided by number of small squares, 1500 divided by 8 is 187. So, that is the heart rate. In first example, there was bradycardia, heart rate around 44, and in this case, it is tachycardia, the heart rate is 187. Of course, we have to comment further if it is sinus tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia or atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation that we will learn later how to do that. So let's, let's do some more uh, exercise. I'll give you some time and uh, you may make the calculation. Now do it in your mind. You know the figure of 1500 divided, you have to divide it by number of small squares now if you do in this case, for example, first count the whole boxes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 whole boxes, that means 25, 20, and then 3 on this side, 2 on this side, so that makes it 25. So 1500 divided by 25 is 60, so this is heart rate of 60. In this case, let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, so I think 4 whole, whole boxes and that is equivalent to uh, 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 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 into 5. How much is that? 20 and 25 by 2500 by 20 is 75. Similarly, in this case, the heart rate calculated is 88. In this case, the heart rate would be slightly faster than normal 125. Of course, in all these ECGs, rhythm is stable. If patient had irregular heart rate, then this formula would not be applicable. Then we have to use a different technique. Let's see, let me demonstrate you the other technique also. Now, this is the case. In this case, if you calculate the heart rate from these two adjacent R wave, it would surely be very different than if you calculate from these two because it is a basically an irregular rhythm. So what we do is we count a strip of five seconds. You could do it for six seconds and multiply it with 10. You could count 10 seconds and multiply it with six. Or in this case, in, I have counted for five seconds, one, two, three, four, five. And let's count the number of QRS complexes in this five second strip. Now that we will have to do it manually. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. 
so 11 complexes in 5 seconds now if you make the calculation then we have to multiply the number of hours uh, in 5 seconds in this case 11 and we have to multiply with 12 why 12 because 5 second is 1 12th of a minute so 11 multiplied with 12 would give you the heart rate in this case average heart rate is 132 per minute you could count 6 and multiply with 10 or you could count 10 and multiply with 6 so everything will actually the result would be the same heart rate so this module was on basics of ECG and how to the normal waveform and normal pattern of depolarization and repolarization and how to calculate heart rate when rhythm is stable and also when it is slightly irregular. Let's see the normal ECG now. So normal ECG you would say when there is you have examined a long lead 2 or 3 because you can determine the heart rate and the rhythm from there usually P wave is present there are normal healthy people where in a particular ECG P wave might not be present but mostly ECG would show a P wave P wave is best seen in Limley 2 and Precordial V2 usually normal P are in trouble I say usually because normally it is less than 0.2 but there are people who may have little longer little shorter but still normal P wave followed by QRS because it is the same current which originates in the S node and then depolarizes atria and ventricle so every QRS must be preceded by P wave and you should have as many P wave as QRS complex in most cases but of course example exceptions are there we will discuss them but if all of them are normal then you can say the ECG is normal uh, I remember one of my teachers he said uh, one of the authors actually I used to follow he said that most difficult ECG to diagnose is normal ECG because you have to fulfill so many criteria only then you can say that this ECG is normal uh, and, and if you're looking for a particular abnormality the moment you see that and you make a diagnosis uh, but a normal ECG does not guarantee normal heart and abnormal ECG does not uh, indicate that there is a serious problem with the heart ECG has its limitations so we will understand that this is just one example uh, rate is 68 beats per minute I just calculated rhythm is normal sinus rate because every quality is not great actually so if you look at this lead continuous lead every P wave is followed by QRS complex and you have as many P waves as QRS complexes axes are normal ST segment is isoelectric QT interval is normal so conclusion is this ECG is normal thank you very much uh, I hope you liked this video and if you did then please follow all videos about 25 which uh, we are going to have them and they will be released over a period of I think not more than three months so your one uh, component of your curriculum in the interpretation of ECG uh, will be done in two to three months this has been Professor Aziz Rahman from Medistan I really look forward to see you in my next video thank you for joining